Good morning, everyone. Welcome. I'm Joel Hellman. I'm Dean of the School of Foreign Service here at Georgetown University. I want to particularly welcome um, our student audience here um, at a packed house um, at Copley Hall. I want, to in, I want to welcome all of you who are joining us on Facebook Live. And I want to spend and send a particularly warm welcome to our colleagues at the Brookings Institution who are co-hosting this, um, uh, many of whom I'm sure are watching with us online. Let me say, first of all, just welcome. Uh, as the oldest school of international affairs in the United States, founded 100 years ago in the aftermath of World War I, the transatlantic relationship and the security that it has provided us um, has been a central tenet of this school and a central platform and foundation of what this school was built to do. So it's with that particular um, a history that makes us so excited to welcome here today the Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. As is our tradition, um, we are going to have a student um, do the introductions to this panel. So let me um, welcome one of our students, Bianca Hurlery. She's a second year graduate student in our Master's of Arts program in German and European Studies. Um, her bachelor's degree is in clarinet performance, um, uh, which really uh, tells you something um, about her interest in linking together culture and collaboration as a basis for international cooperation. Um, uh, but she's moved on from clarinet studies, um, and she's pursuing a national security studies concentration here at Georgetown. And she's also, in addition to her work, she's here at Georgetown. She's been a project analyst for Expressions Network, a defense contracting company here in DC. So let me welcome Bianca, let welcome you, and looking forward to the conversation. I will say we will have time for question and answers from the audience and from Facebook Live after, so we look forward to having your engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean Hellman, for that very nice introduction. I would like to welcome everybody to NATO in a Competitive World, a conversation with Jens Stoltenberg, hosted by the Walsh School of Foreign Service and the Brookings Institution. Today, we are honored to be joined by NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. He assumed this role in October 2014, following a distinguished international and domestic career. As a former Prime Minister of Norway and UN Special Envoy, Mr. Stoltenberg has been a strong supporter of greater global and transatlantic cooperation. Mr. Stoltenberg, Stoltenberg's mandate um, as NATO Secretary General has been extended until the end of September 2022. Before coming to NATO, he was the UN Special Envoy on Climate Change from 2013 to 2014. He has also chaired UN high-level panels on, um, on climate financing and the coherence between development, humanitarian assistance, and environmental policies. As Prime Minister of Norway, Mr. Stoltenberg increased defense spending and transformed the Norwegian Armed Forces with new high-end capabilities and investments. He also ended a 30-year dispute after signing an agreement with Russia to establish maritime borders in the Barents and Polar Sea. Mr. Schultenberg was also prime minister during the deadly terrorist attacks that killed 77 people in 2011, urging in response more democracy, more openness, and more humanity, but never naivete. Today's conversation will be moderated by Dr. Michael Hanlon, Michael Hanlon is a senior fellow and director of research in foreign policy at the Brookings Institution, where he specializes in US defense strategy, the use of military force, and American national security policy. He co-directs the Center for Security, Strategy, and Technology, the Defense Industrial Base Working Group, and the Africa Security Initiative within the Foreign Policy Program. He is also an adjunct faculty member at Georgetown's uh, security Studies Program. Um, Dr. O'Hanlon is the author of a number of books on international security and warfare, most recently, The Art of War in an Age of Peace, U.S. Grand Strategy and Resolute Restraint. I would also like to add that Georgetown University is committed to standards promoting speech and expression that foster the exchange of ideas and opinions. While it is recognized that not everyone may, sh may share the same views as a speaker, it is expected that everyone in attendance at this event respects the right of the speaker and the organizing student group to share their perspectives and ideas by not causing a disruption to the event's activities. 
At the conclusion of the event, there will be a question and answer session during which you may ask questions. We are very excited to have attendees both in person and online today. For those of you joining via Facebook Live on the SFS Facebook page, please feel free to submit questions in the comments section of the live stream. So Dr. Hanlon, I will now turn it over to you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. I'm not Dr. O'Hanlon. Uh, <laughs> I am uh, Jens Stoltenberg. Uh, but uh, thank you so much, Bianca, for that uh, very kind uh, introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, uh, Dean Hellman and Dr. O'Hanlon for, for inviting me. It's great to be here, and it's a great honor for me to engage both with the Georgetown University and with the uh, Brookings. Uh, and I have to tell you, it's great to be back because uh, when I came uh, to this campus, I actually remember that I attended back in 1988, a program from young, for young, uh, aspi I think not, not aspiring, but young leaders uh, from Europe. Uh, and uh, I spent three weeks here, and that was really a great uh, uh, experience for me as a, as a relatively young uh, Norwegian uh, politician. Um, uh, and then I have to also tell you that for me to be at the university is always a great experience, because I like the atmosphere, I like the kind of academic uh, atmosphere at a place like this, and especially at uh, such an old and distinguished uh, university, it's great for me to be uh, here, uh, not least because my plan was not to become a politician. I had one clear ambition in my life, and that was to <laughs> become uh, an academic. Uh, and I actually started to do some research uh, um, at the Norwegian Center Bureau of Statistics, and uh, my aim was to become one day a professor in econometrics, uh, statistics and the mathematics and, uh, and developing macroeconomic planning models for uh, Norway. I, I, I have to admit that I, I was there only for uh, two years and then I was asked to become deputy minister for environment and I promised my wife only to be in politics for a couple of years. I've been there for like 40 years. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and therefore, uh, when, I, when I come to a place like this, I understand that I could have an alternative life, uh, which I missed. So it's great to, to look into that uh, beauty of uh, research and academic uh, life that you actually have here at Georgetown. Um, I will actually only give a very brief introduction, and then I'm ready to take your uh, questions. Uh, <clears throat> the last time I spoke to Brookings, NATO was preparing for uh, our summit, uh, which we conducted or, or, or had in June this year. That was a successful summit, opening a new chapter in the transatlantic relationship between North America and Europe. Nevertheless, questions are being asked uh, about uh, the strength of the bond between Europe and North America. Uh, over the AUKUS uh, deal between Australia, the UK, and US, and over the withdrawal uh, from Afghanistan. We must always uh, take uh, our differences seriously and address them, but they do not change uh, the big picture, the importance of Europe and North America uh, standing together in NATO. In fact, the need uh, for transatlantic unity is greater today than at any time since the end of the Cold War, because we are at a pivotal uh, moment for our shared security, where we face a more dangerous uh, and a more competitive world. Russia is more aggressive abroad and more oppressive at home. China is using its economic and military might to control its own people, coerce other countries, and assert control over global supply chains, critical infrastructure, and other assets. We also face more frequent um, and sophisticated cyber attacks, persistent terrorist threats, and the security impacts of climate change. None of us can face these challenges alone. No country, however big, and no continent, however rich, neither the US nor Europe alone. But in NATO, we are not alone. Together, we represent 30 different nations, 1 billion people, half of the world's 
um, economic and military might, and together we are adapting to a more uncertain world. In fact, our reliance is in the midst of a fundamental shift. This started in 2014 in response to Russia's illegal annexation of Crimea. We are shifting our efforts and resources from large combat operations outside NATO territory to further strengthen our deterrence and defense at home and prepare for a world of greater state-to-state -state rivalry. All allies have increased defense spending, invested in high-end capabilities, and boosted the readiness of our forces. We have increased our presence on land, at sea, and in the air. Deployed uh, multinational combat-ready troops in the eastern part of the alliance in the Baltic region, and strengthened our defenses against cyber and hybrid attacks. At our summit in June, uh, we agreed to uh, do even more together to modernize and adapt our alliance, to chart our course for the next decade and beyond. So as we continue to boost our military readiness to respond to threats from any direction, we're also sharpening our technological edge by launching a new Defense Innovation Accelerator and Innovation Fund to support industry, startups, and academics working on cutting-edge technologies. We are strengthening our cyber defenses and increasing the resilience of our critical infrastructure and supply chains to reduce our vulnerabilities. We are stepping up uh, to defend the rules-based international order by deepening our cooperation with like-minded uh, countries and organizations, including in the Asia-Pacific. And for the first time in our history, we are putting climate change and security at the core of NATO's agenda. Climate change fuels and multiplies the risk of conflict and threatens our security and impacts the environment in which we operate. So NATO must play its part. We are adapting our planning, installations, and equipment to more extreme weather, and establishing the first ever methodology to map military missions across the alliance, so that also we can contribute to the goal of net zero emissions. Taken together, this shift towards deterrence and defense at home and modernizing NATO will contribute directly to our shared security. We do not know what the next crisis will be, but we do know that whatever happens, we are safer when we stand together. Europe and North America, strong in NATO for more than 70 years and we must continue to stand strong together to face a more competitive world. That is good for Europe, and it's good for North America. So thank you so much, and then I'm ready for your questions. Mr. Secretary General, that was wonderful. And it's just so great to see everybody here. Uh, thank you for the energy we're all feeling from the audience and from the Georgetown community. And I also wanted to, uh, building on Bianca's excellent introduction, say a word of gratitude for your service. Uh, I think you know some people say that Angela Merkel became sort of the leader of the free world. But now that she's on the way out, uh, your tenure as a major statesman in the West is really uh, up there as the most long-standing, and I think the most productive. And I really wanted to begin, if I could, with a few, just a few questions before we go to the general <coughs> audience. But I want to start with Russia, because, of course, you began your service as Secretary General after having been Prime Minister of a NATO member country during a period when Russia was getting a little bit more problematic. And then in the early months of 2014, things got very tough. And, uh, and there have been a lot of responses that you've helped orchestrate or coordinate since then by NATO, including more burden sharing, 
including putting battalions and brigades in Poland and the Baltic states, um, including the European Union and American and Norwegian sanctions on Russia. Uh, how do you feel about the state of European security vis-a-vis -vis Russia in 2021? Do you think that after these seven years of pushback that we have at least partially stabilized the situation? I realize nobody in your position is going to want to say things are fine as long as Vladimir Putin's still sitting in the Kremlin, still trying to cause mayhem in some of the Western democracies. But do you feel that we've at least made some progress and that we're a little safer today vis-a-vis -vis Russia than we were seven years ago? So yes, we have made a significant progress and we have adapted NATO, not least, to respond to a more aggressive Russia. And as I said, we, the really big adaptation of NATO started after the illegal annexation of uh, Crimea. But at the same time, I think we have to realize that the relationship between uh, NATO, uh, the, the, uh, the transatlantic family, and Russia is at the lowest point since the, since the end of the Cold War. Um, uh, the, the, after the end of the Cold War, we actually thought that we were able to build a relationship with, uh, with, with, with Russia to, to, to strengthen our, to build a partnership with Russia. And, uh, and I remember I attended the NATO summits where actually uh, President Putin was uh, uh, attending the same meetings. We established something called the NATO-Russia Council. Uh, we had step-by-step uh, step, uh, strengthen our cooperation and, and, uh, and political dialogue with Russia. And, um, and, and many of us were quite optimistic. Then this gradually started to change, um, uh, partly in 2008 when Russia went into Georgia and, 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 and actually uh, took control over part of uh, Georgian territory. And then uh, uh, the big change came in 2014 uh, with the illegal annexation of Crimea. Uh, and, then, uh, and then after that, they have continued to destabilize eastern Ukraine. On top of that, we have seen a significant military buildup by Russia. They have deployed a new uh, advanced weapon systems. They have violated one of the cornerstone of arms control, the INF uh, uh, agreement that banned all intermediate range uh, weapon systems. Uh, and, and we have seen a more aggressive Russia uh, abroad uh, in many places, and then a more oppressive uh, Russia at home, uh, cracking down on the, uh, opposition, as we have seen, for instance, against Alexei Navalny. Uh, so this picture is serious. Uh, uh, the good news is that NATO has responded in a very decisive and united way, as you just referred to. Um, and we do so also knowing that we have what we call a dual track approach to Russia. Uh, deterrence, defense, and dialogue. It's not deterrence and defense or dialogue. When we are strong, when we are united, we can talk to Russia. And we have to talk to Russia because we don't want a new Cold War. We don't want a new arms race. And Russia is our neighbors, so we need to engage with them. And I can tell you, as you refer to that, I know that even during the coldest period of the Cold War, Norway, as a neighbor to Russia, was able to talk to Russia mm. on issues like energy, a new delimitation line, uh, uh, environmental issues, and many other issues. And that was not despite NATO. It was because of NATO. Because NATO provided the strength for a small country as Norway to engage with a big neighbor as, as, as Russia. So we will continue uh, to pursue this dual track approach. Uh, uh, we need to talk to them on many issues, including, for instance, on arms control. And there are many things that have gone in the wrong direction. That is one thing is, 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 as I say, is good, it's a positive sign. And that is that uh, uh, Russia and, uh, and the United States were able uh, just a few months ago to extend the new START treaty, uh, banning, or not banning, but limiting uh, the number of uh, strategic weapons, uh, warheads, uh, and, and also engage in what they uh, it's called to the strategic dialogue on arms control. So uh, I don't know whether I answered your question, but at least I spoke about Russia. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the thing is that uh, we need to just continue the dual track approach to our neighbor Russia. Could I follow up on that too by asking about the future of expansion or enlargement of the alliance, which for some of us uh, who have been concerned about that, especially when Ukraine and Georgia are mentioned as potential candidates, it makes us worry that this is almost a guarantee to exacerbate relations with Russia. You can certainly understand why Ukraine and Georgia would want the opportunity, but is it time that NATO changes the whole dialogue and the whole thinking about what options, maybe we need a new kind of security architecture for 
Eastern Europe. That would not be formal membership in NATO, but also not leave these countries out in the cold with the Russian bear standing next door. Is there any kind of need, that, as you now think about your strategic concept, which will be uh, in many ways the culmination of your tenure, and you think about some of the big ideas that should guide the alliance in the future, do we need some new big ideas on how to think about East European security architecture? I think, first of all, it is important to establish some basic uh, principles uh, and values. And that is that it is the right for any sovereign nation to decide its own path. The whole idea that you know, it's a provocation to Russia that, that small neighbors join NATO is absolutely wrong. Mm. That's the provocation, that anyone is saying that. Mm. Because, because it is enshrined in different documents, agreements, treaties, and not least the Helsinki Final Act, that every nation, of course, has the right to choose its own path. So it's up to the, the, the individual sovereign nation to decide whether they want to join NATO or they don't want to join NATO. It's for them to decide. So whether a country is going to become a member of NATO is for that aspirant country and for NATO allies to decide, no one else. And, 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 and just this, 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 this message that it is so, so provocative for Russia that Latvia and Lithuania and, and, and Estonia or Slovakia or Czechia have joined NATO, I mean, that just exemplifies that Russia wants a world order where they have a sphere of influence, where they have Russia and then they control their neighbors. And that's not the world I would like to live in. And actually, we have tried for decades to move away from that world. And, and to be honest, there are also some voices in, 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 in the West which say, no, no, we should be careful because we are provoking Russia. But then you're saying that small countries don't have the right mm. to choose their own path, which is like a violation of their so sovereignty. And then sometimes I, I, I use my own country because we, we joined the NATO, and Norway joined NATO in 1949 as a founding member. We are a small neighbor of Russia. And Russia didn't like that Norway joined. Actually, they, Josef Stalin expressed very clearly that he thought that we should stay out. Yeah. But, but, but I'm happy that, uh, that uh, no, Clement Attlee, the Prime Minister of, of, of UK, and uh, Truman, I guess it was, uh, the, the, the President in the United States, and all the other leaders, they said that Norway, they can join if they want. Josef Stalin is not going to decide whether NATO can, Norway can be a NATO member. So we joined. We provoked Russia, maybe, but we are part of a very happy family. So, so, so that's my main message. And, and, and there are too many people who are a bit uh, unclear on these fundamental principles, meaning indirectly accepting some kind of sphere influence for big powers. Uh, that was then the other thing. Uh, and that is uh, Georgia and Ukraine. Of course, it's only for NATO members and Georgia and, uh, and Ukraine to decide when they're ready to join. Not Russia. No one else has a veto or a say in that. Um, so uh, uh, we support their efforts to modernize, to reform, to meet the NATO standards. Uh, and when 30 allies agree that they are ready to join, they will join. I cannot tell you when that will happen, but, but that's, that's the only way that this can be dealt with. Having said that, I think it's obvious that, that it, it will not happen tomorrow, that they will join. So therefore, my message uh, to NATO allies, and also something I discussed actually yesterday with uh, uh, President Biden, uh, is that we need to step up and do more for those aspirant countries. Because as long as they're not members, we should provide more support, more training, more capacity building, help to implement reforms, fight uh, uh, corruption, uh, build their security and defense institutions. Uh, so, so, so we need to establish that there is a lot in between nothing and full membership. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, that's what I'm pushing hard in, uh, within uh, NATO, and I hope that we can make some ambitious decisions at the next NATO summit. But again, that doesn't change the sovereign right of every nation to choose its own path. Extremely cogent and powerful message. I've just got really two more questions, and I want to share the privilege here with the audience pretty soon. But let me ask you about <coughs> Afghanistan and also about China, if I could. You, you already referred to Afghanistan in your opening presentation. And uh, a lot of us in the United States, a lot of Americans were happy with President Biden's decision in April, which really seemed like it was President Biden's decision, not NATO's decision, to leave. 
Uh, a lot of us were concerned, however, uh, at how this has played out. Some of us were against it from the start, but leave that as it be. Uh, I, I realize you don't want to rehash that decision, but I, I wanted to invite you to speak about how NATO is going to recover from the withdrawal and the chaos of the summertime. Um, and specifically, if I could ask this, you, you've been clear in saying that the men and women who served from all these NATO countries and other countries in Afghanistan should be proud of their service because they've kept us safe for 20 years, among other things, and they've given Afghans at least a vision of a better future, even though that's going to be challenged now, perhaps, by Taliban rule. It strikes me there's one more argument, and I wanted to ask for your comment on this, which is I think the Taliban may feel like they got a certain kind of victory against us, but they also are impressed by our combat capability. They've been fighting us for 20 years, and it's pretty clear to me watching them the last couple of months, they don't want to fight us again. They helped us do the evacuation. They gave us permission to control Kabul, even if it had already fallen to them. They didn't do a great job of security near the airport, but they actually tried to help. And they're going out of their way not to pick a fight, at least not a military fight with NATO, it strikes me. I think we have created a certain form of deterrence, even in a losing effort or a strategic failure, as General Milley said last week. Do you agree with that? But more generally, how do you uh, look back on the Afghanistan mission and the departure of this past summer? I think I have to start with the beginning, and, uh, and that is that after the 9-11 attacks on the United States, where close to 3,000 people were killed, it was obvious that we need to, uh, there was a need to react. Uh, and we reacted strongly, uh, of course, the U.S., but also all NATO allies. Uh, and uh, and uh, NATO allies, together with partners, we have been in Afghanistan for uh, 20 years uh, uh, with the main task of preventing that uh, country from once again becoming a, a, a safe haven for international terrorists, where they can organize, plan, train for terrorist attacks against our own countries. So we were in Afghanistan to protect ourselves. We invoked Article 5 to protect uh, ourselves. Um, and, um, and, uh, and, and actually, we achieved that because for these, over these 20 years, there have been no terrorist attack against uh, our countries, organized, planned, uh, executed from Afghanistan. Meaning also that the mission was not in vain. And those who have paid the ultimate price, those who have lost loved ones, uh, family members, they should know that actually they uh, made an important contribution, uh, they made a difference in the fight against uh, terrorism, and we have seen the devastating effects of that 9-11. Uh, and, and, and you also have to remember that all the efforts, not only in Afghanistan, but, but, but also sharing more intelligence, uh, 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 improving the way we, we, we counter terrorism, has actually meant that since 9-11 we have not seen anything of that magnitude before when it comes to terrorist attacks against our own countries, and that has not just happened by accident, it's a, it's a result of huge efforts by NATO allies and some partner uh, countries. Then the plan was never to stay in Afghanistan forever. And, um, and uh, uh, therefore we uh, faced a very difficult dilemma when we started the discussions after signing of the US-Taliban uh, agreement in February 2020. Uh, uh, for the U.S. Uh, and also uh, to leave and, 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 and end the, the military presence there. And the dilemma was the following. Either to leave and then risk Taliban returning, and we were clear-eyed about that risk. Um, the surprise is actually not that Taliban came back. The surprise was that it happened so quickly. Um, either to leave and risk Taliban returning or stay, but that also entailed risks of more fighting, more violence, more casualties, and most likely also the need to send in more NATO troops. So there were no easy options in Afghanistan. And then it was actually, of course, the US that made the decision on behalf of the United States, but they made that decision after extensive consultations with all NATO allies. I've seen some reports that there have been no consultations. That's factually wrong. We had three ministerial meetings, we had a, a, a number of committee meetings, North Atlantic Council meetings at the, at the ambassador level at NATO discussing whether to stay or leave Afghanistan uh, also throughout the whole winter and even before that. Uh, so the idea that, we, uh, that, that the United States did not consult is wrong. We, we went in together, we adjusted our presence together and we uh, left Afghanistan together. The main task now is to do whatever we can to preserve as much as possible of the achievements we made. 
on terrorism. That means to hold the Taliban uh, uh, government accountable for what they promised on terrorism, or not allowing Afghanistan being a platform for launching terrorist attacks against our countries. Um, but also to be ready to strike uh, over the horizon long distance and to stay vigilant as NATO allies to, uh, to, to follow, follow and monitor closely any attempts to reconstitute international terrorist groups in Afghanistan aiming at us. Um, then we have to hold them accountable for what they have promised on human rights. I, I mean, it's not very promising what we have seen so far. Um, it's a tragedy for the Afghan people, especially for women. Um, uh, but we need to put leverage on them, the, the leverage we have economic, financial, political, uh, uh, to at least allow humanitarian organizations to come in with development aid, some, some support, uh, and also to continue to push them on these, uh, uh, also on values uh, and, uh, and, and human rights. And thirdly, we need to continue to get people out. Uh, whatever you think about the evacuation and the withdrawal, it was a huge and impressive achievement to get 124,000 people out of Kabul uh, without military evac evacuation. The US in lead, but also other allies participating. And NATO also coordinating uh, uh, many of those efforts at the airport. Uh, this we will do as allies continue to be vigilant. The last thing I would say is that the whole perception is that Afghanistan is a tragedy for the Afghans. Mm. But it doesn't reduce or weaken the need for Europe and North America to stand together. Mm. So sometimes this is mixed. Also, I, I'm, I, it's a bad situation in Afghanistan, but it hasn't weakened uh, uh, the, the, the message and the need and, the, and, the, and the, the, the relevance of a strong NATO, if anything, just highlighted the importance of what we can achieve together when we stand together uh, in a military mission like uh, Afghanistan. Are you hopeful, like I am, that the Taliban will be impressed by Western military power enough that they won't want to collaborate with Al-Qaeda or any other extremist group in an attack on the West? In other words, that there may still be some deterrence even in the aftermath of this mission failure? I don't like to use the word hopeful about Taliban. Uh, 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 but I think, I think they understand uh, uh, what we have told them, uh, that we have capabilities, we have the capacity, uh, uh, to also strike from uh, over the horizon, long distance. Uh, uh, NATO allies will do so, uh, and especially the United States. Um, uh, and we also use the, the political and economic and financial leverage we have. Of course, it's less leverage than when we had thousands of troops on the ground, but, but it doesn't mean that we have zero, and we will uh, use that. So, last question, small little question, China. Yeah. And, uh, and I realize that China is uh, an issue that grew in importance over your tenure. Uh, Russia started out with a bang and has stayed there, but China's grown. And it's largely a problem for the European Union, and it's often about investment and economic relationships, not just NATO. But I know that, of course, you've thought about, and NATO's thought about China quite a bit in certain realms. And I just wanted to ask for any update from you on how NATO is looking at China, and <coughs> maybe even more importantly, what's the next step in that process? What's the next thing NATO has to do with the strategic concept and beyond to think about its relationship with China? Let me start by saying that the rise of China, uh, that provides great opportunities for all of us, for our economies, for trade, um, uh, for uh, uh, interacting with them. And the economic rise of China also has helped to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. I think there is no, no, it has never happened before in history that so many people have been lifted out of poverty uh, over a so, so short period of time that we have seen in China over the last uh, decades. Uh, uh, in my previous life, I worked a lot on, on child mortality and maternal health, um, on how to reduce child mortality. And, 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 and we were able to, as the world was able to to, to achieve a lot, not least because of the enormous gains uh, made in China over the last uh, decades. Um, then at the same time, the rise of China also poses some serious challenges to NATO allies. And uh, until 2019, uh, NATO did not address that as an alliance at all. We didn't mention China. It was not an issue. Um, and uh, we have seen uh, uh, that we have now come a long way uh, in actually agreeing as NATO, as 30 allies, that the rise of China matters for our security. It has an impact on our security. Um, and, that, and that applies for all allies. 
I, thought, I think that this distinction, to distinguish between China is in the Pacific and then Russia is in Europe, that's wrong. We live in a global security environment. Everything is interconnected. China is close to us in cyberspace. We see them in Africa, we see them in Arctic. We see them investing heavily in our own infrastructure. And actually, one of the first test cases of uh, understanding, uh, of NATO allies understanding the security, potential security impacts of uh, China was 5G. A couple of years ago, most European allies uh, thought that that was only a commercial issue. Who was going to control the 5G network, which is, will, be, will be basic for almost everything we do. Then, after extensive discussions, bilaterally but also in the NATO framework, NATO allies realized that 5G network matters for our security, for the resilience of our societies, and, uh, and therefore uh, we have seen that that has had some serious consequences for who actually provides the 5G networks across Europe and, uh, and North America. Um, uh, so that's an example. Um, China um, has the second largest defense budget in the world. They are investing heavily in new uh, military capabilities, including nuclear uh, long-range uh, weapon systems. They are building a lot of silos for long-range missiles. Uh, and, uh, and that is to expand their nuclear capabilities. And, um, and, uh, uh, and they have the second, no, they have the, the largest navy in the world. Just over the last five years, they have deployed more ships than the entire uh, British navy. So, so this is a huge and strong uh, uh, military capability, which is expanding year by year. That matters for our security. We don't regard China as an adversary. We don't regard them as, a, as an enemy. Uh, but we need to uh, uh, relate to uh, all the aspects of the, the, the rise of China for our uh, security. Uh, we have done that by, for the first time, mentioning China. Uh, we did that in the, the communique or the declaration from the NATO summit in uh, December 2019. That was only one sentence. Uh, at the summit in June this year, we had actually some language and some agreed positions. And then I, I expect that the uh, upcoming new strategic concept for NATO will actually reflect a much more comprehensive and, uh, uh, and, 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 and unified position on how to relate to China. Uh, then what we do on technology, on resilience, uh, on, on investing in new high-end capabilities, we don't put the label China uh, on that, but it, but it matters also when it comes to China. The last thing, and then I promise to end, uh, is that we will continue to engage with China on climate, uh, on, on arms control. And I spoke just last week with the Chinese foreign minister, and I, in a way, conveyed the same message as, as I conveyed to you today, that that we don't uh, uh, want to isolate China. We, 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 we also see the, the big advantages for all of us, uh, uh, the economic uh, strength of China, but there are also some challenges. Uh, we need to address them, and we will address them together as NATO. Fantastic. Well, let's bring in some questions from the audience, and uh, we may get enough right from the room that we don't have time for uh, online questions, but if you want to send in online to events at brookings.edu, we might be able to get one or two of those in as well. Until I see the hook from Dean Hellman, we will take questions. So maybe I'll take two at a time, if, if that's OK, starting maybe here in the second and third rows. Uh, and yes, please. Is it on? OK. All right. Oh, sorry. Hi, uh, my name is Birgit Musai. I'm a graduate student here at School of Foreign Service. I'm also an Albanian American from Kosovo and deeply disturbed about the situation right now in northern uh, part of Kosovo. And uh, my question was, what is the role of NATO, specifically K4, in ensuring that the destabilization and the disturbing of peace uh, doesn't occur again, especially since you mentioned that it should be the decision of a small country to decide whether they want to join NATO. Um, so Kosovo has made attempts to join and is working towards that. But until then, do you think that allowing the Kosovo army in the north of Kosovo or establishing a no-fly zone would be a solution to this, these similar incidents occurring in the future? Thank you so much. And do you want to just answer no. that or take one more first? I take one more. But Great. So. Right. Sir, uh, thank you for taking the time to meet with us today. Uh, my question is regarding uh, Russia and cyberspace operations. I, I think most can agree that Russia has been most successful in spreading its malign influence through cyberspace and infor information operations. Um, NATO has been very successful in uh, countering Russia through conventional means, but um, how do you see NATO's strategy moving forward to 
to uh, deter and defend against Russian cyberspace and information operations? So first, uh, first of all, uh, I would try to be brief because there are many questions. Uh, but but then, forgive me if I don't cover all the issues you raised. But but first on Kosovo, NATO has been in Kosovo for many years. We helped to end the, the bloodshed there in 1999, um, and uh, and we have an international force, a NATO force there called uh, K4, uh, and we help to stabilize the situation to uh, ensure uh, to secure peace and also protect all uh, communities uh, to provide them with a safe and secure environment, including the Serbs uh, living in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Kosovo. Then, over the last weeks, we had uh, some tensions um, at the, uh, the border crossing points, or the crossing points on the uh, administrative borderline or the, uh, between Kosovo and, uh, and Serbia. Uh, I will not go into all the details, but that was about licenses played for cars. Uh, uh, and then we had some roadblocks and a quite tense and difficult situation uh, with also quite uh, aggressive rhetoric. Um, uh, NATO has helped and supported the efforts, which has now led to uh, an agreement uh, to remove the roadblocks uh, uh, and also to, 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 to remove or withdraw the Kosovo Special Police, which has controlled uh, um, that area and, uh, and also the, the border crossings. Now K4 will control the border crossings. And we have found a, a way with some stickers to, to deal with the, with the licensing plates. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and that has at least solved the, the issue we faced uh, now, reduced the tensions now. More fundamentally, what we need is a political agreement. Uh, that's the only way forward. It's not easy, it, but, but, but the alternative is, is, is so much worse. Uh, so NATO strongly supports the EU-led uh, facilitated dialogue Prishna Belgrade. I spoke with Alexander Vucic, the, the, the president of Serbia, uh, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, uh, recently, and also with uh, uh, Kurti, the, uh, the prime minister of Kosovo, and, uh, and we will continue to, to strongly support these efforts uh, to find a political uh, solution, uh, and, and, and KFOR will remain in Kosovo to ensure uh, peace and stability. Um, uh, then uh, on, um, on uh, Russia and cyber, well, as a, a big element, big part of the fundamental adaptation of NATO that has taken place since, 19, since 2014 uh, is cyber. Because there is no way there would be any type of conflict without a significant cyber dimension. So, so it is not like we will have a conflict and then maybe cyber. Cyber will be part of it, most likely from the beginning and even before we realized that it started. Uh, so cyber really matters. And that's also the reason why we have uh, uh, undertaken a huge uh, what is it, strengthening of uh, NATO's cyber capabilities, both protecting our own networks, but also helping allies to protect and support their networks. Uh, we, we have uh, established cyber as a military domain. Before we had land, air, sea. Now we have land, air, sea, and cyber, and actually also space. Uh, we have a, a, a cyber uh, uh, also co command or, or, or a center. And, 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 then, and then we have also decided that cyber can trigger Article 5. And that's a very important message, meaning that, that we regard potentially cyber attacks as dangerous, as damaging as kinetic attacks. You can take as many lives, you can really inflict a lot of harm through cyber attacks. Uh, just imagine 9-11 in cyber, uh, and that would be seriously unharmful for, uh, yeah, for many. So, uh, so we can trigger Article 5, we need a collective uh, defense clause of this alliance, also to a cyber attack. Uh, whether we will respond in cyber or in other domains, that's up to us to, to, to decide. And the last thing I will say about cyber is that we have also, we have also uh, developed uh, uh, what, what is referred to as uh, uh, national cyber uh, effects, uh, but which is actually offensive cyber. Uh, that we can use against, we have used them against, NATO has used them against ISIS or Daesh to take down their cyber networks as part of the uh, fight against uh, ISIS. So we exercise, we, 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 we train, we share best practices. Uh, so we need to maintain our edge also in the cyber domain to remain the most successful and strongest in our history. Fantastic. Let's take these two in the third row, if I could, please, next to each other. Yeah. Uh, so there are three of you. Maybe we should take yeah. all three, if you will. Hi, my name is Jack Gazdia. Thank you for coming to speak with us today. Um, 
how do you envision the future role of NATO in a world with more of these truly global issues that we see with things like pandemics, climate that you touched on? For example, do you envision um, changes in how we interpret Article 5 as it relates to how pandemics, climate, arms control, these different issues affect specific NATO member countries? Like, what do you kind of see as the role of that moving forward? And then, please. Hi, my name is Megan Skinner, and I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service. And in a similar vein, um, I would say that COVID-19 is the greatest security threat that we face today because it threatens the citizens not only of all the NATO allies, but of every country in the world. And I was wondering, do you think that members of NATO have sufficiently uh, collaborated to respond to the pandemic? And what more do you think NATO can do to help end the pandemic. And then we'll take one more if we could, please. Are you? Yeah. Yeah, right here. Yep. Hi, um, my name's Evelina. I'm a student at the Graduate School of Foreign Service, um, also from Stockholm, Sweden, fellow Scandinavian. Um, this summer, I listened to your summer speech for uh, the Swedish radio, yeah. and was very moved by your discussion or talk on Utoya. Yeah. Um, how would you say that attack and tragic event shaped uh, your leadership for not only Norway, but as a leader of um, global security as a whole? Thank you. Thank you. As a first on the pandemic, uh, of course, we face many global threats and challenges. And, 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 uh, uh, and of course, that also matters for, for NATO. That doesn't mean that NATO always will be the first responder. For instance, to a pandemic, I don't think NATO is, is the first responder. We, we have the health, health services uh, and so on, who always, ha who in that case, has to be in the, in the, on the, also the first uh, responders. Uh, but NATO can play a role, not by invoking, invoking Article 5. I don't think the virus will be scared by Article 5. So, in a way, so, 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 so the thing is that sometimes NATO can, also, you know, Article 5 is not, not, not a response, not a answer to the pandemic. But our armed forces and NATO can play a critical and important role, uh, as we did uh, and, and as we will do in any uh, future pandemic. And of course, we can improve and we can, we, can, we can strengthen the way we work together. If you look across the NATO alliance, uh, first of all, we coordinated a lot of efforts by helping to, 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 to transport critical equipment, uh, uh, medical supplies, uh, personnel, uh, we helped to, to set up uh, uh, field hospitals and so on. Um, so this was partly organized and facilitated by NATO, but also partly by our national uh, armed forces. They helped to support the, uh, the, the civilian health services. So on all these issues, I think what we see now is that the, the armed forces, they of course can play a, a role in military conflict, but they also have an important role to play, for instance, in, in uh, helping to address uh, challenges like the pandemic or more extreme weather uh, and uh, and weather uh, uh, sort of events or, or or that that, that poses a risk to 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 all of us. Uh, so that's part of what we do and what we exercise and what we plan for. Um, um, then on uh, on Utøya, uh, first of all, thank you for listening to Sommar i P1. Is it? Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a Swedish thing, uh, uh, which is. Uh, where they sometimes invite Norwegians to be part. So I was very honored uh, to be uh, speaking to, to Swedes. Uh, 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 but you asked me a very serious question about Utøya. Because Utøya, uh, or the tw 22nd of July, that was a terrorist attack on Norway. Um, uh, 77 people were killed, most of them young people, participating on the youth camp uh, just outside Oslo. Um, and that's a place where I have been since I was uh, 14 years old every summer because I, this is the social democratic uh, part of Norway. Uh, and, and I knew many of the people that were killed there and, uh, and, uh, and I was prime minister and they actually the, the perpetrator attacked uh, the camp but also the government building and, and, and my office was totally destroyed by, by the, uh, the bomb. Um, there are many things to say about Utøya, but I think the most important message is that terrorism comes in many forms. And terrorists, they use different uh, guises, or they're trying to, uh, to, 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 to hide behind different uh, religions, different ideologies. 
But at the end of the day, it's always about the same. It's about intolerance, intolerance it's about, about violence, it's about hatred. And it doesn't matter in a way whether they call themselves uh, you know, radical Islamists or, or this guy in Norway, he was a, uh, he was a Christian uh, right-wing uh, guy and he killed uh, young Labour Party people because they were too tolerant and open to let Muslims into Norway. They have nothing, also they, all these terrorists, they have more in common with each other than they have with anyone else because we respect uh, the democratic rules. We respect that differences should be sold in a peaceful uh, manner and then we can be left or right or or green or blue, whatever we are, but we agree on that basic idea that we need strong democratic institutions and that the way to make political decisions, not by violence. So I think the main uh, message for me is that, uh, is that uh, in Norway it was a right-wing uh, guy that misused uh, the Christian uh, religion. In other places we have seen uh, people misusing other religions. It doesn't matter, it is the same. We have to fight it with everything we have because you don't want to live in a society where these people are having any uh, uh, impact at all. I think we have a couple of online questions through Adams, please. Um, thank you. Um, two questions on what you might term disagreements within the uh, NATO family uh, came in from our virtual viewers. The first is if you would comment please on the AUKUS deal, on the uh, deal between Australia, UK and the United States. Uh, are you concerned about the fallout, the disagreement between uh, France and the United States? And relatedly, on France's suggestion that uh, Europe develop its more indigenous capabilities alongside NATO. Are you optimistic or, or worried about this suggestion from France? How do you assess it? And a, related, a second question on Turkey um, and its relationship with Russia, uh, its pursuit of the S-400 uh, missile system. Do you, do you think that this is a concern and how would you manage it? Thank you. Um, uh, first, on the AUKUS deal, <clears throat> I understand that uh, France is uh, disappointed. Um, at the same time, NATO allies agree on the bigger picture, that we need to stand together, uh, also working with our Asia-Pacific partners, which includes uh, Australia, Japan, New Zealand, uh, South Korea. Um, uh, and the AUKUS deal is not directed against Europe or NATO. Uh, it, it, there are two NATO allies, um, uh, US and UK, that has uh, uh, gone into a deal with Australia. Um, and uh, at our NATO summit in June, we actually agreed all 30 allies that we should step up and work more closely with uh, the partners uh, in that uh, region of the world. Um, um, uh, I welcome EU efforts on the fence. Uh, because uh, NATO has been actually calling on the European Union and EU and NATO allies to do more for many, many years, uh, not least uh, uh, on defense spending. It was a NATO decision in 2014 that triggered the increase in defense spending across Europe and, uh, and, uh, and Canada. Um, after years of cutting defense spending, allies have started to increase defense spending, added 260 billion extra. Um, uh, I also think that uh, uh, EU uh, and European NATO allies can do more on providing high-end capabilities uh, and we welcome and support those efforts. What I don't believe in is uh, 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 any efforts to try to do something outside the NATO framework or compete with or duplicate NATO. Because NATO remains the, 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 the cornerstone, the, the bedrock for European security and also for actually North American security. Um, and, um, and this is partly about money. 80% of NATO's defense expenditure comes from non-EU NATO allies. Uh, so, of course, most of what we invest in defense is not uh, within the EU, it's outside the EU. That's mainly, of course, very much because of the United States, but also other allies. Uh, then it's about geography. Turkey in the south, Norway, Iceland in the north, and in the West, uh, US, Canada, and the United Kingdom, if you look at the map, they are important for the protection of, uh, uh, and defense of the whole of Europe. And then most importantly, and lastly, is uh, politics. Because any attempt to try to weaken the transatlantic bond by uh, uh, creating alternative structures, uh, uh, conveying the idea that, that we can go alone, will not only weaken NATO, 
but it will divide Europe. So we just have to stand together, and if anything, it's even more important that we stand together now, because uh, we are faced with such huge challenges, so we cannot afford to start to divide Europe and North America, or, or, or divide Europe. We have to stand together, North America and Europe together, uh, in, in, uh, in NATO. So, uh, and, and for me, the AUKUS deal doesn't change that in any way. And also, I've seen someone saying that Afghanistan changed that. No, not at all. If anything, Afghanistan just underlines the importance of NATO and Europe working together. Um, yeah, so that's my, my answer on that. Then uh, the other one was uh, yeah, S400. Now, I have to admit that that's a difficult issue. Uh, it has been discussed again and again uh, between uh, NATO allies, the US and, and Turkey. Uh, I have raised the issue. We have discussed it. I have discussed it in Ankara with President Erdogan and other uh, Turkish leaders. Of course, it is a national prerogative to make decisions on defense procurements. Uh, at the same time, what I have stated and what matters for NATO is that uh, those capabilities, this is an air defense system, S-400, has to be, uh, has to be um, also, uh, interoperable with the NATO systems, it has, to be, has to be possible to integrate in the NATO uh, integrated air and missile defense. That's not the case for S-400. And therefore, I also tried, we have tried to also find alternative solutions. There's some a Patriot, which is a US system, or something called SAMT, which is a French Italian system. So far, we're not succeeded in that, but we will continue. And we also uh, uh, work on these issues as, uh, as an alliance, because I know that there are some issues and some allies are critical. Uh, and that also is, is expressed uh, openly and in NATO meetings, but Turkey is, a, is an important ally. Turkey played a key role in defeating Daesh, uh, bordering uh, er, uh, Iraq and Syria, and no other ally has uh, received more uh, refugees than, than, than Turkey. So, so Turkey is important. Uh, there are some differences, some disagreements, but we need to address them within the NATO framework. So let's get a couple in the... Yeah, so I see um, two hands again next to each other, a gentleman in a pink shirt and a woman with gold glasses. Maybe we could take those two in what, what might be the last round or at least the next to last round. Thank you so much. My name is Cheyenne. I'm a Georgetown graduate student from Singapore. And there was a CSIS talk earlier with a couple of prominent Chinese academics where they talked about desecuritization being necessary for world peace. My question to you is, given the current trend that you described, you know, with 5G leaving the commercial world you know, also becoming a security issue, what sorts of conditions do you think need to exist in order for desecuritization to actually happen, if at all? Thank you. Hi, I'm Jack. I'm a first year in the SFS. Uh, I just wanted to ask, what role do you think Pacific democracies like New Zealand, Australia, um, South Korea, and Japan um, might play in NATO's relationship with China? Okay, please. Uh, so first of all, uh, I strongly believe in uh, NATO working uh, with, uh, with um, uh, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, they are close partners. Uh, um, they share our democratic values. They, they share our support to rules-based international order. Uh, and, um, and, and this has uh, a value in itself to work uh, with uh, such uh, close partners. Uh, at the same time, there is no, no way to... Anyway, uh, uh, to deny that, that, of course, this is, this is something which has become even more important when we see a more uh, assertive uh, China, uh, especially in that part of the world. We have seen how they have tried to coerce uh, Canada, no, sorry, uh, Australia, uh, and actually imposed very heavy economic sanctions uh, against them because they didn't behave in the way China uh, wanted them to behave. Um, and that just makes it even more important for us to work together with them. I was in my own country. We, uh, in the Norwegian Nobel Peace Prize Committee, awarded the peace prize to a Chinese dissident, and then suddenly China imposed heavy sanctions on Norway because they didn't like that decision. So, so I, I, I don't think it, we can accept that kind of behavior that they try to coerce other countries because they do things uh, China doesn't like, and that just it makes it more important that we work together, stand together uh, with like-minded democracies as New Zealand and, uh, and Australia, also in the light of uh, a more uh, uh, coercive or assertive uh, uh, China. Uh, then on the first question, I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm a bit in, uh, confused. 
uh, what is what, what is to desecuritize? Sure, the way I interpreted it was as the reversal of the trend that you had described earlier, where you talked about how 5G used to be seen as a commercial issue and then now it's become a security issue. I would see that as the reversal of that process. I was just wondering whether you think this is possible at all and what conditions would need to be established for this to be kicked into place. Thank you. Although, also of course, in theory it's possible, but, uh, but the trend is going in the opposite direction. Uh, uh, I think that... Uh, uh, many years ago, it, it was a kind of a civilian life and then it was a military life and it was very easy to distinguish between peace and war. You had either the wars, they took place at battlefields and the war were declared uh, and Abbas went to, uh, to the other country and declared war and then we uh, almost agreed where to fight and, 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 uh, and, and it was a clear start date and a clear end date and it was a clear distinction between peace and war and civilian and military sector. Now, that line is much more blurred. Uh, 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 first of all, you know, in, in hybrid, uh, in cyber, and so on, it's a much more blurred line between peace and uh, and war, uh, uh, aggressive actions or or peaceful uh, interaction. Um, so uh, uh, the trend is going in the opposite direction, and I don't, and I regret that. But that's that's the reality. Uh, that uh, that uh, with more hybrid and cyber uh, threats and and, and attacks. Uh, uh, bigger parts of the whole society is uh, involved also in different kinds of uh, uh, conflicts and, uh, and competition, state-to-state -state, uh, rivalry. Um, uh, I think the long run, the only way to, to prevent this from happening is part, of course, by having some rules of the road, some, uh, some, some, some regulations and agreements, for instance, how to behave in cyberspace. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, this is about trust uh, and, uh, and creating a more peaceful society, a global society. And then perhaps we can also de-securitize uh, some of these uh, civilian um, capabilities and areas where we see state-to-state uh, -state competition today. Fantastic questions and answers. Dean, over to you for the final thoughts. With apologies, we couldn't get more of you in, but thanks. Well, our hour has gone by very quickly. You started, Secretary General, by saying that you thought you might prepare for an academic life. And if I may say so, the clarity of your remarks, the cogency of your arguments, and the strategic vision that you put out suggest that you would have made a very good professor. Um, and indeed, when you step down as Secretary General, you're always welcome right. here at the School of Art and <laughs> Service at Georgetown University. <laughs> Let me, let me thank again our co-sponsors on this, Brookings and, and uh, Mike O'Hanlon. It's great to have you here and great to partner with you on this event, and we hope to partner more. Let me thank again the students for your enthusiastic engagement. Uh, sorry for those we had to turn away from our COVID-related restricted space, um, uh, but hopefully you were able to join online, and thank you all of our Facebook Live participants. Um, thank you, enjoy the rest of the day, and thank you for joining us. Thank you.